Uh, for those of you who heard my earlier speech about the global biodiversity framework, I will now take us on to a different uh, global treaty. Uh, and some of you might be wondering what that has to do with competition for space. So I'm going to lift us up to a higher political level, moving us up uh, at the UN system, where there's also a competition, both in terms of space and in terms of governance systems for space. So in uh, 2023, uh, the UN adopted a new treaty. It was, uh, it's the most important treaty that nobody barely has heard anything about. It's a treaty to protect all biodiversity in areas that are beyond national jurisdiction. That means areas that are not owned by anyone. And this is about 70% of all areas in the ocean. So it's a fairly large chunk of waters that is being protected and that was previously without protection. In June of this year, they decided to meet and start preparing uh, for this treaty to enter into force. Because when it comes to treaties, it's not enough to just say, yes, we'd like a treaty. We'd like an agreement, whether it's on plastics or biodiversity or on governance of the ocean. You have to first say, yes, we all would like to be part of this. Then this has to go back to every single country that signed that agreement. And they have to change their laws in order for them again to adapt to these new regulations. Now for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the sort of constitution of the sea, like the groundwork of all uh, legal frameworks for the ocean, that one took decades to negotiate. So this treaty here took about 20 years to get to where they are. And in general, ocean treaties will take about 10 to 12 years to get signed. And there's no such time. So for anyone that, again, heard my former speech, you would know that this one is also closely linked to the global biodiversity framework that has a deadline of 2030, which means that this has to be a fast track treaty. So already this summer, they were discussing at the EU that they wanted to celebrate next year. So this would, in that case, be the fastest treaty that has ever gone through in ocean governance. But before I get to more specifics on how this treaty is going to affect fisheries uh, and the competition for space, I'd like to just show you what it really looks like on the global governance stage. Because there's a lot of global governance when it comes to fisheries. There's a lot of stuff going on up here in terms of who gets to do what in the ocean. So this is the UNCLOS here. Uh, that's the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Under UNCLOS, you have the fish stock agreement. You can see that there. That's the agreement that regulates fisheries, primarily in areas beyond national jurisdiction. You also have the exclusive economic zones. Those are the areas that countries own, where they make all the decisions. And then if you move over to a different section of the UN, you will get the RFMOs, that's Regional Fisheries Management Organizations. So Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, those are the organizations that actually manage fisheries in these areas that nobody owns, right? Because you do have a lot of migratory fish species, species that move from one area to another. It might be for a while inside Norwegian waters, and then it'll move over into different waters. So you need to have a big global governance system to take care of this. And just to show you a little bit of a map of what it looks like, because it's kind of a patchwork of regulatory systems. Some are overlapping, like NEFEC. Some of you might have heard of that, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission. It governs that area, but it governs the areas that are not governed by other countries. So even though, for example, it looks like it governs all of the Norwegian areas, it doesn't. It governs those areas between countries. Then you have a different regulatory set of groups that are the tuna fisheries. They go all over the world. And they are really big organizations that cover some really valuable species that are out there. And what's really important here to see is to see this in connection with this new treaty that's also supposed to govern all these same waters. But there's one big caveat. Fisheries are not included. 
which was a really big setback for many, because they wanted fisheries to be included. They wanted someone, sort of like in Lord of the Rings, one, one ring to govern them all, someone to collect them, because a lot of these are not collaborating. Most of them are not even functioning very well. And they wanted someone to be like the overseer, and that fell apart really fast, because these were some really powerful regional fisheries management organizations that did not want this to be part of it. But fisheries is still affected by this treaty. It's affected by it, not in a negative way, as it may sound like by the tone of my voice right now. I'll be happier. It can be good for it. Uh, so the High Seas Treaty is a treaty to protect biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It covers, first of all, a very big commodity, potentially, marine genetic resources. And some of you might say, well, that's fish. Probably, a lot of fish, but not in the sense of it being fish. If you harvest fish as a commodity, it's out. It's not part of the treaty. If you harvest it, harvest it for genetic resources, for cancer medication or skin care or pick your DNA, then it's under the treaty. Environmental impact assessments, that's part of this treaty. That also may not sound very important, but for fisheries, it might be really important. For example, if somebody wants to start deep sea mining in an area where you like to go fishing, you might want to be part of that participatory process of giving your input to whether or not you think that will have an impact on the environment where you harvest fish. Marine protected areas, that will definitely have an impact. But where are they going to be putting these marine protected areas? Because if we recall those maps we saw, it's pretty full already. But a lot of these uh, different uh, RFMOs are already implementing marine protected areas. They're a bit ahead of the curve. They do know some of these RFMOs, that they need to have marine protected areas. But if you also recall, uh, many of these are also overlapping. So that means that one marine protected area might also be in an area for another RFMO that has a migratory species coming through. And this is where the BB&J will come in and where fisheries need to be involved together to make sure that they don't undermine one another. Undermine is a big word in, uh, in the UN system. So at Sintef, we've been following these negotiations. We've been going to these meetings. And uh, I must have stepped out at this point. I'm not the one taking a picture from the behind the president's back, but up in the top right corner is where I sat for basically six years, except for COVID years, following all of these negotiations and listening to how they were discussing these things. And these are really powerful actors that really want to make sure that the marine protected areas also don't affect their fisheries, but also that the marine protected areas that they want are going to be in an area that is also not going to affect, for example, offshore wind or deep sea mining or any other industries. One interesting uh, group that always came to these negotiations was the Underwater Cable Association. I had no idea there was one. There's a really powerful stakeholder, go figure. They are very interested in environmental impact assessments that could affect them, where fisheries also come in, in terms of bottom trawling. So there's a lot of areas where fisheries can and should get involved when it comes to the BBNJ Treaty. The other one is that the global biodiversity framework that I've come back to from earlier as well cannot be implemented if the BBNJ treaty does not protect areas. And it might sound like, oh, these are all competing against each other, all these treaties. But as the Icelandic delegate here said, it's like, it's just, we're the same people. Like, Iceland is still Iceland. And we all go to these same meetings. We all go to the same places. The, the delegate from Palau, for example, goes to them all. <laughs> She's the same person. So a lot of these times, they do need to just make sure that the BBNJ Treaty can be there to help coordinate all the different events that are taking place in all these different treaties. And if we go back to that part here that we set up earlier, 
we get these two new ones here. So if you see this one here, this is where we get B, B, and J. Over here is where we get the Global Biodiversity Framework. So you see, those are two new actors that entered this and made it even more complicated, because now they too have to be part of this coordination and this fight for both space and areas in terms of where they operate. The other thing is, what's not mentioned here is this one. That's deep sea mining. So if you think of it, this new treaty is basically not including fisheries and it's not including deep sea minerals. It's including everything else that's in there, but both of those industries have to have environmental impact assessments for them, for the same states to be able to let them do any kind of work there. So there is a, there's a lot of coordination going on between them. And there's a lot of overlap. And the BNB and J, as I said, have to ensure that they do not interfere with any of these others. That's where their biggest challenge is within this, because all these fisheries can come in and say, you're now interfering with what we do. You cannot put marine protected areas in this area because that's where we fish. But at the same time, fisheries can also come to the BBNJ Treaty and say, we do not want to have any kind of activity in that area because it would disturb the fisheries that we work with. So these are some of the concrete ways in which they can collaborate. And it's going to be really necessary because the fishers are going to get a lot of opportunities to participate in this. It's written directly into the treaty that fishers and fisheries organizations will be able to come, be consulted, secretariats of different treaties have to collaborate to come up with good solutions. And that's to make sure that once we do have this competition for space, we do collaborate across all of these different treaties so that one treaty does not give a regulation that interferes with another. And that is going to be the main role of the BB&J and where the fisheries are going to have the biggest role. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I'm on. Thank you. Uh, other, we have time for one small question. Yes, we have one down here. Where's the microphone? One small question, because I, I looked in the maps for uh, our aquaculture, because I understand it's not covered by this fishery stuff. So I ask you, where is aquaculture covered? Is it covered? No, it's, it's not. Uh, and the most important thing for aquaculture and how that could be involved is the same as with fisheries. So if you have offshore aquaculture that will be near an area that is outside national jurisdiction, countries outside can demand an impact assessment from aquaculture. And in the same way, an aquaculture industry can ask for an environmental impact assessment from uh, other activities that are adjacent to the area where it is. So it all depends on how far out aquaculture end up, ends up going. Does this work also national? Can a, a Norwegian group ask the, 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 the aquaculture sector to come to do an assessment? Or is it, is it for example, the Scotsman that has to do it? Or? This is still up for debate. Uh, they have not specified whether or not it's the company itself or the flag-bearing state of that company that has to do the uh, impact assessment. I worked a little bit with Paul Very worried about this because they said aquaculture is too small to get a treaty. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. If we are allowed to give you the 15 minutes you're promised, we still have time for a question. If not, we can might try to catch up some time. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you. Rachel, thank you. Thank you.